chapter three, atomic structure. So just to recap from last week or two weeks ago, <clears throat> the atom, the atomic structure. So we have the protons, the neutrons and the electrons. And it's very important to memorize or just to, to be familiar with the locations, the charges and the masses of each of these three subatomic particles. Now the protons, they're positively charged. They are in the nucleus and they have an atomic mass of about one AMU. So AMU is the base atomic mass unit. So um, it's, it's about one. And in reality, it's 1.007, but it's about one. And then neutrons, neutrons have a zero charge, right? They're neutral, pro positive plus charge, new neutral zero charge. They are also in the nucleus with the protons. So collectively, some people like to call the protons and the neutrons nucleons which is just a funny word for the protons and the neutrons or anything that's in the nucleus, we call them nucleons. And this also has the mass of about one AMU. Um, it's actually 1.008. So it's a little bit bigger than the proton, but not too much. They're about the same mass. And then you have the electron. So electron, electricity, negative. So you think of negatively charged things. So electrons are negatively charged and they are outside of the nucleus. And if you remember, I had the GIF last class of the Jimmy Neutron uh, GIF where you have the protons and the neutrons in the middle, and then you have the electrons zooming around on the outside. So that's exactly what the atom looks like in a close up atomic view. And then the mass for an electron is gonna be about zero AMU and specifically 0 0.0055 five, or 3055. So it's very, very small. That's why we consider it for this class, almost negligible mass. So I would say, remember at least the approximate masses, the locations and the charges. Okay, so something that, another thing that we learned when we talked about the periodic table, we saw the periodic table for the first time is the atomic number. So the atomic number is the way that the atoms are arranged in the periodic table. It's the main way they're arranged. So you have hydrogen is one, Helium is two, and then lithium is three, etc. So it's arranged in this way, going from the top left all the way down to the bottom right. And this number, the main way they're arranged by, it represents the number of protons in that atom. So hydrogen, every single hydrogen has one proton. Every single helium has two protons. Every single lithium has three protons. And these protons, they cannot be lost or gained. So the number of protons can't change. So for every single, we learned about isotopes. For every single isotope of hydrogen, they have one proton. So we learned about another one called deuterium, which has the mass of two, but one proton. And then we learned about tritium, mass of three, but one proton. And then normal hydrogen has the mass of one and one proton. So even though the masses can change, the number of protons for that specific element has to be constant, has to be that number that is on the PR table, the atomic number, and they can't be lost. If they are changed, right? So technically you can change the number of protons in an atom in a nuclear reaction, which we'll learn about in another chapter. But if you do that, then it is now a different element. So if you change, if you can collide a hydrogen with another hydrogen, you can get a helium. And that happens all the time. You could do a nuclear reaction to do that. So <clears throat> we'll learn about that in the future. Now, if you change the number of neutrons, which we did learn about last class, you get an isotope. So an isotope, just to reiterate, is an atom with the same uh, atom of the same element with a different number of neutrons. So that's exactly what we have here with these three hydrogen isotopes. We have the normal hydrogen, which we know as having a mass of one and that mass being the one proton. And then we have deuterium, which is what we consider to be heavy hydrogen, or if we see something like D2O, that means heavy water, which the hydrogen has double the mass. It has a proton and a neutron. And then we have tritium, which is mostly in space. It's radioactive. And we have two neutrons and one proton. And there could be, some, for some elements, there's a lot of isotopes. It could be five or six even. This is a ton. Uh, some elements of the heavier ones have 20 isotopes because 
um, the number of neutrons that it can have varies a lot. And some of them could be stable and some of them could be radioactive, but there's a large variability of how many isotopes a, an atom could have or an element could have. So that's isotopes. And then the question is, now we learned about the protons can't really be changed because then it changes the element. The isotope, or sorry, the neutrons can be changed because it just changes if it's an isotope or not, or what type of isotope it is. But the question for this chapter is, what happens if you change the number of electrons? So protons, we know we can't change them. Neutrons, we can. It just changes the mass. Um, now, what do you guys think? I want to hear from somebody. If you change the number of electrons, so they're, they're negatively charged. Now, do you think, so what do you think? What do you think will change if you change the number of electrons? Anybody? If you change electrons? Well, I would assume that the molecules will start to put, pull away. Since yeah, so, okay, so good. What makes them pull away? Mm. So what do you mean by pull away? You're on the right track. I don't know how to explain it. I, it, the, the force. <laughs> force, force, okay. What made you say force? I just pictured in my mind. Okay, so um, which information on the top made you say force? Was it the mass? Was it the location? Or was it the charges? The charges. Good, the charges, exactly. So great answer. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. But what you're trying to say is the charge will change. If you change the number of electrons, if you add them, the charge will decrease, will get more negatives because you're adding negatives. If you increase the number, sorry, if you decrease the number of electrons, the charge will get more positive. So you can change the charge. It doesn't really change the mass at all, right? Because the mass is considered to be negligible for an electron, but the charge will change. So that's what we're gonna be learning about today is what we call the different atoms that have different charges. And what what do they mean? And you said they, they uh, they repel or they, uh, they get, yeah, what would you say? They, um, they get forced away, right? So um, they can get forced away or they can get forced towards. I mean, if you have one atom that's positively charged, one atom that's negatively charged, they, they will come together. But if you have two atoms that are negatively charged, they will go the opposite way from each other. So uh, we'll be learning about that. So good job. And here's exactly what happens. So if you have a substance that when it's dissolved in water creates charges such as salt, then you pass what we call an electrolyte. Now you've probably heard of the word electrolyte from Gatorade commercials, right? It has a full of electrolytes and electrolytes are good for you, right? And really what scientifically an electrolyte is, it's just something that can conduct electricity, a solution that is based in water that can dissolve or that can uh, transmit electricity. And what that means is it has ions. It has partial positive and partial negative charges. Uh, it looks like we have a question. So Evan, do you have a question? Uh, yeah, Professor. Um, they said electrolytes um, from Gatorade. So it's like, the, um, I heard it was like sodium, right? That your body right, exactly. Sodium. Good, good. So the electrolyte part is anything in the substance, and Gatorade is obviously water-based, that has a charge. So you have a bunch of different ions. And we'll learn about that word ions today. One of them is sodium. Another one is a big one that you need for your for health is potassium. You have magnesium is also important. It's a two plus charge. Uh, you have even even your body needs a like multivitamins. You have iron, which is important. Um, so that's just to name a few. And then even uh, like chlorine, not too much, but a little bit. Um, so yeah. So those are some trace. Those are some ions that you need. Sodium, potassium are really the main ones that contribute to a lot of your metabolic functions. Yeah, exactly. So all they mean when they say electrolyte is ions, things with charge. So that's really all they mean. And sodium and potassium are extremely important because for every one of your cells to function, we have what we call a ion gradient. So on the inside of the cell, you have sodium and potassium. And on the outside of the cell, you have potassium and you even have some sodium there, but they're in different ratios. And this ratio of potassiums and sodiums on the inside and the outside 
creates a chemical gradient, makes it an ionic gradient. And what that means is because of the charge differences on the left and the charge differences are, are sorry, on the top and the bottom or inside the cell and outside the cell, it actually creates forces. And the forces could push ions in and out, which makes um, your, and which makes the metabolic function of the proteins on the outside of the cell work and on the inside of the cell. So it creates a chemical gradient, which then creates an electronic gradient because you have the different charges. So um, this using having these electrolytes can increase your metabolic function. So as opposed to normal distilled water. So I mean, it's why if you're active and you just drink water, that's great. Water is fantastic. But if you are, let's say, um, running for like 20 miles, right? Water is not going to do it. You need substance. You need electrolyte substance either by like people who run marathons, even or ultra marathons run for 50 miles at a time. Even they have like chocolate bars or, or something that has just more chemical substance that can help with your energy and give you more energy. So then they have cliff bars and things like that. But um, so something about Gatorade and, and a lot of these energy drinks or a lot of these electrolyte rich drinks is if you're doing a, they're only beneficial, well, they're beneficial most of the time, but they're, you, they're mainly beneficial when you're doing an endurance sport. So for me, like I, I've been a baseball player my whole life. I've done track, which is, I, I've, done, I've been a sprinter in track, right? So it's a very short term thing uh, in terms of your races, but, and everyone in baseball would have Gatorade and it's a common drink in really any sport growing up. And for baseball or, or even things like, like basketball or, or, or football, in football you see Gatorade a lot, or Powerade, any of these other electrolyte drinks, is that <clears throat> your your endurance is not really being tested, for, especially for baseball. It's really a non-contact, very slow sport. You can be significantly out of shape and be really good at baseball uh, just based on how you hit, um, <clears throat> as we've seen in the major leagues with some players. But so your endurance and your and your energy levels are not really being tested in a lot of those sports. Even basketball, where you're running around the whole time, uh, for most people, it's not going to be your, your electrolytes aren't going to get depleted from doing that, even if it's for an hour or two. Uh, and so really, the only people that should need Gatorade or need these electrolyte rich drinks to perform better are people that are doing endurance sports. So let's say if you're doing a triathlon, if you're doing um, your biking 50, 50 to 100 miles at a time, or you're running a marathon, or you're doing, you're swimming for hours on end. So for these really heavy endurance sports, those are the only sports that really should be utilizing these electrolyte rich drinks, because that's where your act, your, your body energy level, or your energy, uh, well, your energy level is tested in those, and you really need to get as much energy as possible. But in most sports that are the common sport, even soccer, um, even though you're running for hours on end, it's kind of stop and go and you can kind of rest in between but so that's basically that's my opinion well it's not that's kind of fact but that's that's my take on it um okay so basically we oh, know that, oh yes professor when um my daughter was small i used to give her um pedialyte when she was pedialyte's sick. fantastic yes i also seen like when people have a hangover that they will drink pedialyte yes so uh pedialyte is basically like Gatorade on steroids. It has so many electrolytes and has so many other different sugars and different other molecules to boost your metabolism and to, um, and to kind of, yeah, to boost your metabolism. And the reason why people take Pedialyte with hangovers, also bodybuilders uh, drink Pedialyte. So for hangovers, it's to get your metabolism working again to process that alcohol and to flush it out of your system faster and also to just boost your ionic gradients in your, in your cells and to make them move and to make them work faster. And for bodybuilders, it's to replenish energy faster and also to replenish muscle fibers faster. So Pedialyte is fantastic. And also if you're sick, um, like, so like my, I always have Pedialyte in my house just because if, if I ever get sick or anything, it's like kind of like a booster and it's, it's natural. It's better than having any kind of energy drink. Energy drinks are terrible for you. But something like Pedialyte, it's all natural nutrients, and it's if it's meant for babies, then it's then it's it's obviously going to be good in terms of for in terms of the uh, energy properties that it has for even for adults because it has the necessary ions and the chemicals that you need, the sugars and the things you need for energy and for uh, metabolic function. So definitely great point there. Pedialyte's fantastic. 
Uh, okay, so let's move on to um, electrodes. So an electrode, basically, you can have positive electrodes and negative electrodes, which we'll look at here, which can be put into different solutions that have this, these electrolytic or electrolyte solutions in order to attract or to repel all different charges. So the positives and the negative charges that are generated from these ions or these positive, these, uh, yeah, the ions that are positive and negative charge. Now we'll learn about the term ion in the next slide, but basically what you need to know is just the definition that an anode is a positively charged electrode, which is over here on the right, on the left. And an anode, since it's positively charged, it can attract negatively charged particles in an electrolyte solution. So those kind of ions would be a fluorine minus, chlorine minus, and uh, other ones like that. So nitrogen, three minus is one. Um, what else? So sulfur, two minus, oxygen, two minus. So there's a bunch of different negative ions that can be attracted by an anode. And then a cathode, which is on the right side here, it's negatively charged. So the way I think about it is anode, I don't know, I just remember anode positive, cathode negative, um, but the cathode's negatively charged, it can attract positive charges, such as a lot of the ions that you need, sodium, you got potassium, you got um, lithium a little bit, or plus one, um, magnesium, two plus, calcium is a big one also, can't believe we forgot that one. Uh, so calcium is big, iron, copper, zinc, zinc is huge, so zinc is very important for your body. Um, things like that. <clears throat> so, uh, so now let's talk about exactly what these ions are and how they're formed. So an ion, very important definition, is an atom or a group of atoms with a charge. So that can either mean, that's a general term, for a positive charge or a negative charge. Then you have an anion. So anion means negative. So I think of anti or, I don't know, ants, if you don't like your ant or something. No, I'm kidding. But like, you don't like the, the bug, ants, insects, right? So then you can think of negatively charged. And then for positive charge, they're called cations. And since I have a cat, I remember them as cats are positive, cats are good. So positive ion. So you have negative ions and you have positive ions. And in order to, they're, in order to uh, form positive or negative anions, like we talked about, it's not by the change in the number of protons or the change in the number of neutrons, but it's by the change in the number of electrons. So if you have a neutral atom, so let's say you have helium. So helium being neutral, it has two protons and two electrons. And in all of these atoms, we assume they're neutral until there's a change. So the protons, and generally we say that um, everything on the PR table, every if you have consider an element like helium, we just say it has the number of protons based on its atomic number and the number of electrons based on its atomic number. So that means it's neutral, two protons, two electrons. But in order to change helium into an ion, either positive or negative, we can't change the protons. The neutrons have no effect because it doesn't change charge protons are positive and neutrons are, are zero, the electrons have to be changed. So if you add an electron to helium, what does that do? It makes two protons and three electrons. That means the difference in the protons and electrons, meaning the net difference is negative one. So what that means, if you add protons, or sorry, add electrons, the charge gets more negative. So if you go from a neutral atom to an, a negative charge, the way to do that is you add electrons. To go the other way, a neutral atom to a positive charge, you lose electrons. Because if you're losing negatives, you gain positive. So if we use this helium example again, let's go up here. Let's say you have two protons all the time, but you're removing an electron. So you only have one electron there. The net charge of this helium atom would be positive one because the difference between protons and electrons is towards the proton side of positive one. So that's how you get a cation. So cation is created from losing electrons and it's a positive charge. It's kind of 
difficult to memorize because it's kind of the opposite. You're losing things to become positive. But if you look at what you're losing, you're losing electrons. So electrons are negatively charged. Losing, elect losing a negative is the same thing as gaining a positive. And gaining a negative is the same thing as losing, as losing charge, as becoming more negative. So that's important to know. And any questions on that? No? <clears throat> okay, so a good question to ask would be, how did we come up with this? So like, what's the deal? Like, how did we figure out that we have these protons, these neutrons and electrons and, and they, they're responsible for charges and so forth? So one of these main experiments that we're gonna talk about is Rutherford's gold foil experiment. And <clears throat> before, this, before this experiment was conducted, we thought of the plum pudding model. I don't know, what, I never had plum pudding, nor do I want to, it sounds gross. But what this model was, was for the atom at the time, before 1911. And we thought of it as just a mishmash of protons, neutrons, and electrons all piled together. So they didn't really know what the atom or the atomic organization was. They were just like, all right, we have protons, neutrons, and electrons. We know there's a positive component. We know there's a negative component. And we know there's a neutral component. But they're just globbed in there with no organization. Until 1911, where Rutherford came out with his gold foil experiment. And he did this experiment where, I'll explain it. This, this is a fast, very fascinating experiment that he had a beam of radiation, right? Very small particles, high energy radiation. So he shot the beam of radiation, kind of think of it as like a laser, through a sheet of gold foil. So if you look at a sheet of gold foil, just picture it as aluminum foil, but more expensive, right? Because it's gold. You would expect, based on the plum pudding model, that a gold foil, just like any other foil, is a bunch of gold atoms just lined up like this. And it's it's a solid sheet, right? We can't see through it. We can't touch through it. It's just a solid sheet of gold particles, of gold uh, gold atoms. So he expected, what do you, what's going to happen when you shoot a beam at it? We would expect it to just bounce back. And this film on the outside is a detector. So any radiation particles that are detected or that hit the screen are then detected and put into a counter. And you can detect how many particles were detected at each angle from or through the gold foil. So what he expected is, all right, there might, there's probably going to be no particles that bounce and hit the, hit this counter. They're all going to bounce back into the detector or into the, into the source because it's a solid gold foil. They may bounce back this way and this way, but they're all going to bounce back. And that is the opposite of what happened. So what actually happened is most of them went through about 99% of them went through, as you see here. So here's our alpha source, our source of radiation, and they all went through, except for a few. A few of them were deflected. So he, he was baffled. He was like, how is this possible? And we came to the conclusion that the only way that most of the particles of the radiation went through the atoms, a solid sheet they went through, that's crazy is that this sheet isn't as solid as we thought. It's actually very empty, very empty space. And we came to the conclusion that most of the atom, 99% of the atom, 99% of the atom is empty space. So that's crazy that 99% of the atom is empty space. So everything that we see, and everything that we are is 99% empty space. So how does that make sense? Because we see things, we can touch things, we can't go through materials, right? That does, how does that make sense? Well, atoms are so freaking small, like we learned in chapter two, that the nuclei, the things that are solid and that you can't go through, are so close together that to our reality to what we see through our eyes and how our brain processes it, that everything is basically, everything that we see and touch is basically solid. 
and we can't go through it because our nuclei, the, the part right here that is solid and dense, they're so close together that they basically make a solid structure. But if you have particles that are smaller than the nuclei, such as these radiation particles, or on the same order of scale of the nuclei, you'll see the actual nature of the atom and you'll see you'll be able to go through the atom. So that's incredible. And to give you an idea of how big the atom is and of empty space is, let's say we consider Yankee Stadium, right? An entire baseball stadium. Um, the pitcher's mound of Yankee Stadium. Compare that to the entire stadium, to the entire, or if you're like a football fan, maybe the, the circle in the middle where they do a coin toss, right? Right around midfield. That is about the size of the nucleus in comparison to the empty stadium being the rest of the atom. So that's, in, that's, that's incredible that they found this out back in 1911 when we thought all atoms have to be solid because we can't see through them and we can touch solid particles. But Rutherford proved this wrong. So that's insane. And then from that, we deduced that, all right, what is in the middle? It has to be our solid particles that have the most mass because in order for them to have mass, that means they take up physical space, meaning they're not empty. So we, we came up with that our protons and our neutrons of mass one are in the middle. So they're in the nucleus. And then our electrons of negative of mass negative that are very, or sorry, not mass negative, of mass about zero. So one over 1837 is 0.00055. And we came up with that this negatively charged particles are on the outside of the nucleus spinning around very fast. So we kind of learned this already, but this is just bridging the gap between our information and how we know our information. So it's very important to, to think about that. It kind of makes it makes the world different now that you learn that you know that 99% of everything is empty space. And it's just our mind that looks at the reality this, this way. Now, if we were on atomic scale, let's just think about this. We we can consider ourselves on an atomic scale if we look at space. So if we look into the into, into outer space, we view that because we're small enough, we view empty the outer space as mostly empty because you have, might have a planet here or there, but those planets are millions of miles apart. And you could consider those atoms or those, sorry, those planets to be like nuclei of atoms. And they're millions of miles apart. And we can consider most of space to be empty. But if you were on a larger scale, let's say some kind of cosmic giant that can look at our solar system and our galaxy at, at a micro point of view, so or a macro point of view. Let's say they're gigantic. Let's say there's a there's a beings out there that are the size of galaxies. We they they would look at our world. They would look at our outer space and be like, those those planets are so close together that it's basically a solid material. That your galaxy is basically solid. All the stars and all the all that all of that material that's in there, the stars, the planets, billions and billions of them are so close together that it's basically a solid particle. That's the way we look at atoms, that they are so small relative to our huge size. They're so close together that we view them as so close together that it's a solid material. But if we were the size of atoms, we would see that most, uh, or we were on this, the, the order of scale of atoms, we would see it as mostly empty space. So that's incredible. And that's a cool thing to, to think about that it's all relative everything's all relative and um it's just the way our mind processes the photons that go into our retina and into our corneas or really our retina and that's really what processes our world and how we how we um, how we see it so it's all, all based on our reality it's crazy um okay so enough enough of philosophical stuff all right so um let's cover more chemistry well, that is chemistry, but that's more interesting than this stuff. But anyway, um, atomic number. So we should know that this is the 
symbols that we see on the periodic table. And the atomic number is always the whole number on the top. And that is the number of protons in the nucleus. Good. Then the mass number. So the mass number is the sum of the protons and the neutrons. And usually the mass number is not on the periodic table at all. Usually you see a decimal. And the decimal is what we, what we call the average atomic mass. So for all the different types of isotopes, let's say for hydrogen, it has three. We have the hydrogen, which is a 1-1, one, one, the deuterium, which is a 2-1, and the tritium, which is a 3-1. The average atomic mass, meaning the weighted average of these, is 1.008 for hydrogen. If you look in the periodic table, that is the atomic mass of hydrogen, the average atomic mass. The reason why is because the natural abundances of hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium is very heavily towards hydrogen, where you have is about 98% hydrogen, about 1.8% deuterium, and 0.2% tritium. So if you take the weighted average of these, meaning 0.98 times 1 plus 0.018 times 2 plus 0.002, times three, you get about 1.008, which is a very close weighted average to one. So I'm not expecting you to do this math, but I just want to let you know that on the periodic table, you do see the decimal numbers. And these decimal numbers are what you're going to use for the atomic mass calculations, for the molar mass calculations that we did in chapter two. And that's where it's derived from. It is an average, a weighted average. So that's the mass. So that's that. And then the mass number is just for a specific isotope. And it happens to be the sum of the protons and the neutrons in the nucleus. Now, if you were given an atom, let's say germanium, that has 32 protons, and you're given the mass number is 74 mass, meaning the protons plus the neutrons, then what is going to be the number of neutrons? Can anyone answer that for me? So how many neutrons are we going to have in this germanium atom? <clears throat> so remember, the mass is the, everything that has mass in the nucleus, the mass number, or anything that has mass in the atom, which is the protons and the neutrons, are going to be added together to make the mass number. So in germanium, from its name germanium and from the atomic number, we know it has 32 protons. So how is many neutrons? Uh, yeah, exactly. So 74 minus 32 is 42. Nice. Good job. So you have 42 neutrons in this isotope of germanium. If the mass number was 75, you would have 43. If it was 76, you would have 44, etc. So what we learned from this is that we can take the mass number, which is a whole number, minus the protons, and it can equal our neutrons. So that's something that we can learn. You can write that down if you want. That's a, that's a good definition. Basically the same thing as the mass equals the sum of the protons plus the neutrons, just a different way of writing it. Because usually you're not given the, the neutron number, you're just given the protons and the mass. So that's a fair game question on an exam is figuring out how many neutrons there are in an atom. If I give you the mass number and if I give you the protons. Any questions on that? Okay, so uh, here's isotopes again. Now here's the example for hydrogen. We have an isotope, the same number, the same atomic number, but different masses, meaning they have a different number of protons because the, or sorry, different number of neutrons because the neutrons contribute to the mass. And you can see they all have one proton, but the neutrons differ. We'll learn more about this and why that tritium is radioactive where the other ones aren't. We'll learn about that more in the radioact radio radioactivity chapter. I think that's chapter eight. So um, it has to do with nuclear forces and things like that. Um, okay, so into nuclear forces, we have nuclear symbol. So we can have separate symbols for our isotopes, which I kind of drew them already. So I'm going to draw two different types of symbols. The atom so you can see how the nuclear symbol is different than the periodic table symbol, which the periodic table symbol, let's say for hydrogen, is one on the top 
the H is in the middle for hydrogen, and then 1.008 is on the bottom. This represents the periodic table symbol, which this is the number of protons, and this is the average AVG atomic mass, otherwise known as the molar mass. So when you're being asked to calculate what is the molar mass of H2O, you use this number, the bottom one. So it'd be 1.008 times two plus 16, because 16 is the molar mass of oxygen. And that would be about 18. But for the nuclear symbol, it there are different ones per every isotope. So hydrogen has one atomic symbol. It is this one. It's on the periodic table. But for each of its isotopes, they each have different nuclear symbols. So the mass numbers on the top, in this case, it's flipped, kind of, it's kind of the opposite. Mass numbers on the top, the element symbol is kind of next to it on the bottom. So it would be H. And then the atomic numbers on the bottom, which for every hydrogen is always one. Then for deuterium, it would be two, because the mass number is then two hydrogen because it's in, it's still hydrogen and the mass number will be one or sorry the atomic number will be one and then for tritium which is the isotope of mass three for hydrogen we'd have the protons being one and in this case the mass is now three so for every atomic symbol you can have multiple nuclear symbols and this depends on how many isotopes of that element exist there are some elements that only have one isotope, such as fluorine. So fluorine only has one isotope. And this is mass number of 19 and atomic number of nine. So that's, that's the only one for fluorine. Um, but for a lot of most elements, there's multiple isotopes. So uh, any questions on this? No? Okay. All right. So uh, the flame test. Uh, so just oh, the yeah. numbers are, I'm sorry, the numbers are just flipped in comparison to the chart. Is, that's what um, you're saying? Which numbers? You mean, you mean the, these ones, the one, two, three? Like for the nuclear symbol, they're just, yes. the numbers are, all right. I'm, I'm sorry, you cut out a little bit. I know. I have somebody coming to look at my Wi-Fi. My Wi-Fi is sucking. Oh, oh, that sucks. Um, yeah, but the, basically, the, so the nuclear symbol the top number is the mass. Bottom number is the proton. So if you have a specific an element like hydrogen, the protons are always going to be the same. We can never change the protons of an element. But for the mass, the mass differs because we have different isotopes. So um, let's say on a, on a test, something I could ask you is, if you have carbon and if you have carbon that has a mass of 13, what is the nuclear symbol? So you would put 13 on the top, carbon would be here. And since it's carbon, you can look at the periodic table and see the proton number is six. So it'd be like that. And then follow up, I can ask you how many neutrons are in this carbon? And you would do your 13 mass minus the protons, which is six, would then equal seven neutrons. So stuff like that is, is fair game. Okay, hopefully that answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right, so uh, the next thing, um, we're really gonna cover this in lab. I mean, if we were in person, this is really cool lab where we kind of, we use different salts like calcium salts, strontium salts, potassium, sodium, and lithium salts. And we, by a salt, I just mean a different ionic solution. So you have like lithium chloride or sodium, sodium chloride even, potassium chloride, calcium carbonate or calcium chloride. Um, so, or strontium nitrate, things like that. 
and we dip our little rod into them and then we put them over the Bunsen burner and we get really cool flames. And this flame test could be used to detect what elements are involved in or what elements are in a certain mixture, a certain ionic mixture. Now, in the, we're not going to be able to do this in person, obviously, but I think in one of the simulations, we do see, a, it's called spectrophotometry, and we do see this kind of um, simulation. I think it's a couple, a couple labs. From so that's what happens there. Okay, so then the way we can accurately detect, rather than just by the, the visible color, is by using a continuous a spectra. So basically, we're not going to go too far. This, we're not going to be tested on this stuff, on the spectra, because that's more for lab. But just to tell you um, briefly, basically every element has a different line spectra, which can be detected using a uh, spectrophotometer. And you can kind of use a spectrophotometer to look through and see the flame, and then you will get different bands of light based on their wavelengths. And the phenomenon for this has to do with the spontaneous electron emission, but uh, we'll talk about that in another chapter when we talk about electrons. But um, so basically for every element has a characteristic wavelength or bands of light. So sodium, for example, if you see sodium, sodium is basically a yellow flame. And the reason why is because if you look at its emission spectra, it has one solid band on yellow. Whereas hydrogen, even hydrogen is a couple of bands. Calcium has mostly blue, but it's a couple of red. Barium, because so it's kind of a mixture of different colors. But for something like sodium, it's mostly pure yellow. And that has to do with the electrons kind of being excited by the flame energy, and then they go back down to ground state and emit light. But um, so each element has its own characteristic line spectra. And from the flame, we can determine what that line spectra is. Uh, okay, so for the last important part of the chapter, we're going to cover the periodic table. And we're going to really go over the organization of the periodic table. And it's great how the periodic table is set up, and it has different sections that are distinct from one another. And the different sections mean different types of elements, and also they have different properties. And it's composed of the vertical groups and the horizontal periods. So these are very important words, definitions for you guys to know, because the groups are the horizontal, are the, sorry, the vertical. So we have groups and we have periods are the rows. Very important, because if I tell you group four, period two, you would look at, all right, which one's the fourth column and the period two, which is the second row. So you should be able to figure out certain elements based on the number group that they're in, and the periods that they're in. And there are seven periods, one through seven, and the groups do get kind of complicated, but generally we say there's one to 18, but we do call them the A groups and B groups. We kind of separate them. And I'll explain why we do that. So let's kind of look at the, we kind of have our groups, we have vertical columns. And um, so elements that are in the same group generally have similar chemical properties. So there's different names of groups that we're gonna talk about, such as the alkali metals, halogens, noble gases, um, alkaline earth metals. So there's, maybe you've heard one or two of those terms before, but um, they have, the reason why we call the groups, they have specific names is because they have similar chemical properties to one another. Whereas the periods going across a period there really isn't any similar chemical properties, but they just show an increasing in atomic number as you go from left to right. Obviously, the, the atomic number is going to increase. Usually, the number of, usually the mass, or not usually, definitely the mass increases. The size doesn't increase, but the mass does. And then the, the metallic nature of it in, or decreases, meaning on the left side of the periodic table, you mostly have metals. Once you go to the right side, generally you have more non-metals. That's a, that's a general, um, general thing. All right, so um, we'll cover valence electrons in a second, but 
let's just look at the PRI table first. So here is a breakdown of the PRI table. The PRI table that we're used to seeing has, it kind of looks like that. And then you have a section underneath it. This section underneath it, which is called the lanthanide actinide series, actually belongs in here, like right there. So if we were to split this PRI table open and put this lanthanide actinide series in the middle, it would look like this. So this is the flow of the PRI table. The reason why it doesn't look like this on our real PRI table is simply because the page isn't big enough. That's really the reason. The best way to condense this is just to put it into a 11 by eight and a half page is to put one half, one part of the PRI table on the bottom to save space. So, but generally it looks like this. <clears throat> now, there's a lot of different notations going on here. Don't worry about, there's these NS2, there's 2SSS, SDP. Don't worry about those letters. That has to do with electron configuration, which we're not gonna cover. But what you should know is the groups. And there are distinct names for the groups. And if you wanna look at the names, they're right here. So uh, actually, let's go to ptable.com. So ptable.com is a great periodic table source, the best one there is. And it kind of has, shows an interactive periodic table. This is the one that you should be familiar with. And in terms of PRI tables on the exam, you will be given one. So no need to look online for any other resources because what you're given is the PRI table you're gonna use and it has everything you need. So you can see the atomic symbol, right? You see the hydrogen, you see its name, you see the atomic number is one and the average atomic mass is 1.008. So we have different groups. So the groups are labeled here, one through 18. There's a different way to name the groups and there's a better way. So here's the way. If you look on the top of here, you see 1A and 2A. And if you skip all the way over here, you see three through eight, A. This is the way that we're going to name those top groups. And then over here in transition metals, you see B groups, but we don't really focus on B groups too much. So don't memorize those, but I do expect you to know the A groups because the A groups are very important. So if you look at a PR table like this one, this is 1A, 2A, we skip the entire middle section. And then we go to 3A, which is group 13, 4A, group 14, 5A, group 15, 6A, group 16, 7A, and then 8A. So does that make sense or are there any questions on why that is? Or we'll talk about why that is, but um, is, there, is, that, is that clear? Yeah. Okay, all right, good, good. So it's just something that we have to know. And the reason why we have to know it is because we can tell something from that number that's in front of the A. So we have our A group, think about A is the best and A is the top, right? So that's an easy way to remember that it's only the top groups, the ones that are physically higher up on the periodic table that have this A notation. So the 1A, the 2A, 3A, boron, four, five, six, seven, eight. The reason why is because of the slides that I just skipped, the valence electrons. So valence electrons. So these valence electrons are the most important electrons in an atom. They're the ones that partake in all of the reacting. They're the ones that get lost or gained when they form an ion and they form an, an, an atom that has charge. And they correspond to that number A. So for example, 1A equals one valence electron. 7A equals seven valence electrons. So what that means is that now that we know the A, and now that we know what it means, we can tell based most of the atom, more than half the periodic table, or about half the periodic table, how many valence electrons they have just by looking at them. So if I were to ask you, how many valence electrons does calcium have? How many would it be?
ding, 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 we have an answer. And it's two, good job, Sandy. So it's two. The reason why it's two, it's located in group 2A. For selenium, right over here, SE, how many valence electrons would it have? Seven. Not seven, seven would be this one, it would be the fluorine, chlorine, bromine. Oh, six. Yes, so good, six. That's because it's in group 6A, which otherwise is known as group 16, but group 6A. So we can figure out one valence, two valence, Borons three, valence carbons four, nitrogens five, oxygen row or oxygen group is six, uh, halogens are seven, and the noble gases are eight electrons, eight valence electrons. And that's considered to be a full valence electron shell, but we'll talk about that another time. So that is important. <clears throat> so right now you should be able to figure out most of these elements, the ones that are the A group, how many valence electrons they have based on their number A. Now a good question would be. What about the other ones? So what about the transition metals and what about these inner transition metals, otherwise known as the lanthanides and actinides? So what about their valence electrons? Now, the answer is they vary. So the middle section starting at scandium, this whole middle block, we call it the transition metals. And they are always in transition. So they go from positive one to positive two, they could be positive three, positive four, but they're always positive, meaning they ended, but they're in terms of their charges. Um, and their valence electron number can also change. It could be one, it could be two, it could be three, four, five, or even six or seven. But um, they generally, they vary. So we can't just put a distinct number on, let's say chromium. Chromium is either one valence electron or two valence electrons, but it varies depending on what compound it's in. So they're always changing. And the same for the lanthanides and actinides, their valence electron number is always changing as well. So we can't say definitively what that is. Now, another thing about valence electrons and from this group A is we can tell what the charge is based on the group as well. So we can take it one step further and we can say that in group 1A, this means it has a plus one charge. And the reason why is because if it has one valence electron, what these elements want to do is, and we're gonna talk about this more when we get to chapter four and five, but just to give you a little preview, is that these elements, they like to become ions, meaning become charged, in order to get a full valence shell of eight electrons. Now eight is the golden number. So the noble gases, these guys over here on the right, they already have eight valence electrons. They don't want to react with anything. That's why they're considered to be inert because they, they don't have a need to become ions. But everything else, 1A, 2A, 3A, all the way over, they want to gain or lose electrons in order to become charged. That makes them happier. So for something like 1A, their charge is plus one. The reason why is because they lose the one valence electron they have. For something like 2A, they lose two valence electrons. 3A, they generally like to lose three valence electrons. But then at 4A, it's a little bit different. Sometimes they lose, sometimes they gain. Because four is in the middle of eight and zero. So they can either gain four electrons and become negative four, or they can lose four electrons and become positive four. It varies. But then when we get to five and six and seven, those charges are negative three, negative two, and negative one. Now that you're going to have to memorize in the future, not for this exam, but for the future when we do naming, let's say chapter four, this will come, into, come in handy. I just wanna give you a little preview of it. There is a couple of videos on crash cam going over the charges if you want to just study ahead but i would say focus on your exam first so just to give you a little idea of what you're expecting in the future when we start to name different compounds let's say we talk about um lithium chloride lical there's a reason why lithium can bond to chlorine in a one-to-one -one ratio 
And that reason is because lithium becomes positive one charge and chlorine becomes negative one charge. And the way we know those charges is based on their locations in the periodic table. Lithium is a plus one, it's in group 1A. Chlorine is a minus one, it's in group 7A. And they come together to cancel out in a one-to-one -one ratio. So we'll talk about more of how the math is uh, corresponding to the names of a lot of these elements. So, or a lot of these uh, compounds. So that's for the future. Uh, so that's basically it for chapter three. And here's a little video review. So if you want to talk about isotopes again, periodic table organization, here's a video. And also valence electrons, here's another video. So these videos are pretty good to study from. Um, I would say this in combination with the lecture video and also the crash cam and also the worksheets that you have and the homeworks will be more than enough to ace the exam. So I'm going to end the recording and obviously we can ask questions and then we'll start. All right. So the names of the different groups, you have the alkali metals, right? So alkali metals, it's just a name and it's a name that you should be familiar with. It, all it means is the metals that are in group 1A. So that includes not hydrogen. Even though hydrogen is in group 1A, it's not a metal. It's a non-metal. The reason why they put it there is because really there's nowhere else to put it. You have lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. All you need to know is that this whole group 1A, except for hydrogen, is considered to be alkaline metals. They're very reactive and they explode in contact with water. So that's pretty cool. Um, alkaline earth metals, another very similar name, but it's longer. Alkaline earth metals. They're in group 2A. Ignore this valence electron configuration thing. Ignore that. Just know that they're the 2A name. Halogens. Halogens are group 7A. So we really don't have a name for group 3A, 4, 5, and 6. We do. We peak the uh, nectogen, nectogens, and then the, the uh, calcogens. Not really important. Halogens are the most important one for this, for, uh, for or second most important, whatever. The, the halogens and noble gases are the only ones you need to know. So there's four groups you need to know. Alkali metals, group 1A. Alkaline earth metals, group 2A. Halogens, group 7A. They're very reactive as well. And then you have the least reactive that are basically non-reactive, the noble gases, which is group 8A. So let's look at that noble gases. May I, may yeah, I interrupt you? So for the group numbers on the top, how am I going to remember that row 17 is 7A? Good question. So how are you going to remember that that the uh, 1 is 1A, 2 is 2A, 13 is actually 3A? The reason uh, we could do is you can just subtract 10. That's one way of doing that, that people do it is from 13 to 18, you subtract 10, and that's the number of valence electrons. But if you put this is group group 17, that's not wrong. That's just another way of saying. It. That's the traditional way. It's normally one through 18. But for a number of valence electrons, it's not 17 valence electrons. So the number, the A group is easier to remember. It's easier to, easier to help you with that. And especially when we get to charges, it's easier. So you basically subtract 10. 13 would be three, 14 would be four, 15 would be five, 16 would be six, 17, seven, 18 would be eight, et cetera. So that's how I would do it. Okay, so um, last thing is that the metals and metalloids and nonmetals. Now, this is going to be the general general organization of where the, the physical properties are organized on the periodic table. So the metals are normally on the left side. So they're like in the middle and the left-ish. So if we look at the periodic table in terms of halves, like split it right down the middle in halves, all the metals are generally on the left and also the middle, this transition metal part, and all the non-metals and metalloids are on the right. So the, the metals on the left, and they're kind of, you know, have the properties of metals. They're, they're metallic, they conduct heat and electricity pretty well, and they can be bent. Uh, you have sodium and copper are good examples of metal. Um, then you have the non-metals. 
So nonmetals are kind of dull, non-conductive, usually in a powder. And most of the time they're solid, but sometimes they could be liquid. Um, but you, it's like sulfur, bromine, and those are kind of on the right. So um, here there's kind of this, there's kind of this teal kind of, I call it a staircase. We're going from boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, and asinine, or asinine. And going down this staircase to the right of it, you have the nonmetals. To the right of the staircase, you have these nonmetals. And most PR tables, they show the staircase. They show a kind of like a bolded in line here. To the right of that bolded in line are the nonmetals. And then you have the noble gases, which are in their name, because they're not metals, they're gases. And you can have you could have a gaseous metal, but that's you, that's that's weird. I mean, these are nonmetals. So then you have the metalloids. So the metalloids are they have kind of the middle ground. They're the they have a middle ground in terms of properties between metals and nonmetals. And they're kind of boron, silicon, arsenic, tellurium, astenine. So they're kind of they're the ones that that are on the staircase on the left of it. And then you have these ones, aluminum, gallium, indium, the ones that are in this blue color, those are still considered metals. So if you look at the, the uh, color coding, these are what we call post-transition metals. And they're just still considered metals. They're the exact same properties as the transition metals. They just have nowhere else to put them. They're very similar. So I would say in terms of studying the positioning of the different groups in terms of the, the groups and the types of metals, use this ptable.com. So if you look at, you can highlight metals and it highlights all the metals for you. Highlight non-metals, you can highlight all the non-metals. Noble gases, metalloids, um, alkali earth metals, alkali metals, lanthanides, actinides, so things like that. Lanthanides, actinides, we didn't really cover, but they're there as well. 